Sicily, La Sicilia. There are few places in the world whose name simply leaves you speechless. Well, there may be good reason for being at a loss for words too. Sicily literally has everything. So it's kind of hard to describe it in only a few words. From its long history, both mythological and factual, emperors, rulers, conquests, Sicily has been a hot spot to visit since, well, since it existed. Today, we are going to start a very unique journey through an island that has undoubtedly become one of the hottest names in all of wine. Thanks to our good friends at Feriato. It's another episode of Johnny Say Something. So guys, let's head to Sicily. Well, friends, this is a tough spot. I'm not sure really where to begin because if we want to take this back and talk about the history, I don't know if we can go far enough back to really get the whole story. But one thing I can do is tell you that we are going to be looking at three very different environments that Firiato is producing wine in and looking at these beautiful bottles right here to understand a little bit more about how the land and the indigenous varieties get along. I was fortunate enough that one of my first experiences in Europe was traveling through Greece, visiting archaeological sites. Albeit it was the winter, but we still traveled around, especially the south, and visited a few of the islands, including Crete. Now, this, for me, was one of the first times that ancient history truly came alive. I began to realize the importance of the past, how people worked, how they lived, the way they thought, ate, drank. I know all of this may sound a little deep, but that experience really, really opened my eyes. It opened my eyes and unbeknownst to me, it prepared me for a trip that I would eventually take around the island of Sicily and really beginning to appreciate the ancient autochthonous varieties and the people who have chosen to give them new life. This is exactly where Firiato comes in. Founded in 1984, they have built up over the years a massive and impressive portfolio of six different estates throughout all of Sicily. From the very beginning with their vineyards in the rolling western hills of Sicily near Trapani, their philosophy was simple, yet one that is kind of all-encompassing. If we better understand the land and its indigenous varieties to produce fine wines, Sicily will finally be put on the pedestal that it deserves. This is obviously a tall order, but if there's anyone who can do it, I would put some money on these guys right here. Now, let's think about a few things and try and put them into perspective. The, in the entire world, scientists have defined 12 different soil types that really make up the entire planet. And on the island of Sicily, which has an area of just under 10,000 square feet, which is a little bit larger than the Piemonte, the region where we are now, and it's actually smaller than the state of Massachusetts, there are seven of these 12 different soil types. So it's almost if, as if man simply followed in the footsteps of mother nature, conquering and leaving its mark on this land for millions and millions of years. So it's no wonder that there is so much diversity on this island. And I think it's really hard to fathom until you go there, drive around or through the island from the arid rolling hills full of wheat and vines to the plush green fields with olive groves and fruit trees. So once you realize all of this, it becomes pretty clear why Firiato has made it their mission to bring out the best of this truly unbelievable island. So let's take a look at three of these terroirs, shall we? Okay, let's start with one of the latest acquisitions in a truly innovative project where the sea is the deciding factor for the grapes and wines. See, there are coastal vineyards, and then there are vineyards on an island that has other islands, if you catch what I'm saying. So off the western coast of Sicily, there's this breathtaking archipelago of islands that includes Favignana. Here, Firiato has decided to take on the daunting yet exciting task of working with vines in very unhospitable places. This is another example of heroic viticulture. These vines place their root in these limestone rich soils that have been formed over millions of years by the sea you can just begin to imagine how many fossils can be found there. Think of the extremely unique aspects of this, of this terroir. 
you have the beautiful soils that have emerged from the sea, which is still no more than two meters under the ground. And you have the unpredictable winds of the sea as well. And finally, incredible temperature changes between day and night. Now, we're not gonna be tasting any wines from this area today, but did I mention that this is a three-part series? Stay tuned and you will definitely see some very soon. Next up, we have a terroir which Firiato has a number of important estates in, and this is the western hills of Sicily. This slightly lesser visited countryside is absolutely mesmerizing. For as far as your eyes can see, you have these beautiful rolling hills that when you pass quickly seem like geometric puzzles between the fruit trees, the olive groves, the wheat, and the vines. And although these things may look the same to the naked eye when you pass by quickly, underneath the earth is changing quite rapidly. In one estate alone, Borgo Guarini, one of the largest of their plots reaching 165 hectares, there are three of these 12 principal soil compositions that we talked about before. I don't know about you guys, but I find this truly incredible. And on top of that, they use this diversity to their advantage, carrying out trials on how certain vines react to different climates and soils. A truly unique piece of land. See, throughout these hills, there is a vast diversity in the soil composition. The amount of clay and even microclimates has allowed Firiato to really focus on specific varieties in specific areas. Now we have two bottles to taste from two different hill areas and both of them feature indigenous varieties that have truly won the world over. These individual estates are truly unique. For example, Baglio Soria. Once you take a step back and just take in this unbelievable beauty, you may also catch some wild animals if you come at the right time of the year. See, storks, flamingos, and other birds pass through here on their migratory path annually. And then you have Mount Erice, which besides visually dominating the horizon also plays an important role in the climate. Studying this arid climate, they have understood how to handle the trimming of the vines to make sure that the grapes ripen correctly and yet they are still protected from the powerful sun. They've decided that there, specifically in Baglio Soria, international varieties like Merlot, Syrah and Cabernet have really found a unique expression and one that is undoubtedly Sicilian. We'll touch on a couple more of these when we get to tasting these bottles. But last and certainly not least, we have the unmistakable, untamable Mount Etna, Europe's largest active volcano. The wines from this area are so incredibly special and the reasons are twofold. First, let's focus on the land. Here at Cavenera Estate in Castiglione di Sicilia, we are on the northeastern slope of the volcano. And here, vines can reach over 100 years old. Firiato produces both a white and a red, but we'll be doing a very specific focus on that a little bit later. What I'd like to focus on now is how this young, mineral-rich soil is able to provide unlimited nutrients to the vines, pushing the roots to go down even deeper. We're talking up to two meters deep. In addition to the soil, we also have the altitudes that may surprise you. We're talking between 650 to 950 meters above sea level, that is over 3,000 feet. This combination of lower latitudes and extreme altitudes create a unique climate that can be considered mild compared to other high altitude sites. The fact that these vines don't get that full southern exposure actually lends a hand in the maturation of the grapes. And in the white wine, there's a variety that matures slower too. So, what do you say? Let's jump into these wines real quick. And first up, we have Etna Bianca, Le Sabbia. This is obviously from their volcanic line, and this is a 2019. Here we are talking about two indigenous varieties, which are uh, Caricante and Catturato. We're gonna be talking about Caricante a little bit more right now, but don't worry, again, we'll be talking about all of these things in much finer detail really, really soon. Once again, thanks to Coravin, we are able to taste this bottle without opening it, and I've actually had the pleasure of tasting this already. Um, 
I can already tell you that I really, really love this wine and it was one that I had a hard time not opening completely and just uh, finishing it and enjoying with my friends. But work always becomes comes before pleasure. All right, guys, thanks once again to our good friends at Cordovan uh, because without them, tasting these wines really wouldn't even be possible. I've actually had the pleasure of tasting this wine already, so I cheated a little bit before this, uh, but I will have to say it was really, really hard not to open this bottle and finish it uh, because it is just so, so good. Um, this is a blend of two indigenous varieties, which are Caricante and Catturato. We're gonna talk a little bit more about Caricante right now. Um, Caricante is really interesting, again, for this northeastern slope and sun exposure because it is a slow maturing grape. We're actually talking about a the second week of October for a harvest, which, especially in the south, that is, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's almost unheard of, but that's quite rare. Caricante also has a brilliant amount of beautiful acidity, including malic acid as well. So this wine uh, almost always, and it needs to go through malolactic fermentation. And this is something that has been going on since really the early 1800s where they would leave it in contact with its leaves and that malolactic would just kind of jump off immediately. The other aspect that Caricante really, really loves about this unique Mount Etna Terroir is the soil, obviously. We're talking about extremely young soils, uh, really geologically in terms of age. Now these soils are also super rich with nutrients, as we said before, but they also drain really well. Uh, and that drainage, the porous soils, uh, is something that these, that these vines truly, truly love. Another thing that we can think about, especially for the Caricante, and one of the reasons maybe why it, it survived the way that they, it did uh, in this area, has to do with the fact that you know, this grape is actually really sensitive to diseases and in the area of Mount Etna, both because of this soil and also uh, the temperature and the way that basically all of the, se the seasons work together, uh, it's been able to resist in a very natural way uh, a lot of these diseases, and that's been obviously a huge plus. All right, less talking, more tasting. One thing I will say, which we really didn't get into at all, but I would like to just tip my hat off to them because, I mean, it's almost too difficult to, to name them all. Firiato does an incredible amount of work in terms of sustainability, sustainable practices, um, biodynamic and, and organic farming. Um, these are things that I don't want to say that they've that they've wrote the book on it, but they have been working since day one in a way that truly enhances the land. And instead of taking something away, they're more focused on giving something back. Uh, they know, and Sicily has always been this way. It has been a it has been an agricultural hotbed. Um, people live off the land quite literally. This is the way produce, fresh produce, is one of the one of the main you know, exports, let's say, of the island. So because of that, it's so necessary to take care of what you have. And this also goes into creating um, zero carbon impact across all of their estates, which again, these are investments that these people make uh, because they see a long-term vision for these wines and also uh, for the name Firiato. All right, we have this beautiful straw yellow with a little bit of green reflection. Oh, that nose, as we like to say. Wow, so beautiful. So Caricante gives off these notes of apple and maybe even a little bit of, even a little bit of ginger. Now, obviously there's Catorato in this as well, but you can sense this acidity uh, already coming from the nose, there's this freshness and it's this acidity mixed with a minerality that we're definitely going to find on the palate. On the nose, you're still getting like a white peach, which again is one of my favorite fruits um, to kind of find in a glass because it's one of my favorite fruits in general. Um, but you're also getting some nice yellow blossom uh, flowers, um, really, really beautiful. Wow. Uh, you even find a little bit of pear in there. Just a, just a beautiful and intriguing wine on the nose. Uh, 
I can understand. Again, these wines are so authentic. They're so, they're so individual. And I think that is one of the things, and that really has been the philosophy of Firiato since day one. And I'm excited to try these other wines just to kind of, again, get this sense every time we pour a glass that really this, this wine could not be produced anywhere else. It could only be produced on this part of the mountain. And again, to be specific, I know we talked about the overall Mount Etna, including the reds and the whites. These vines come from an area that is between 560, 720 meters above sea level. Um, so some of the reds that they have, they go up just a little bit higher. Another thing that we should definitely talk about with this in terms of the winemaking, as we said before, it has contact with its lees. So after there has been the soft press, the wine is left to rest in contact still with some of those like, leftover elements. Then it goes through a daily stirring, shaking process. Now, this is really going to give this wine an extra boost in terms of body. Uh, it's also gonna make it a little bit more supple. And again, when you talk about the acidity that's in um, Caricante, that's something that you're definitely looking to do. Also, these vines are trained in one of my favorite ways, alborello. So they look like these little trees and you have to think that they do this also for the protection and also to keep things kind of close to the ground. So both the temperature of the ground and the temperature of the sun, these things come together and really help create this overall maturation for these, for these wines. When we talk about Etna wines, when we talk about Les Sabbie de Etna, we are gonna talk about minerality. Now, what does this minerality do to? Science, the jury is still out a little bit, but we know that it has to be something connected to these soils, these mineral rich soils um, that again, whether it's the draining, whether it's the way that um, they're able to hold on to water, constant, constant nutrients available for the grape. There's, there's different reasons why, and probably it is the complexity, it is the sum of all of these parts that really gives us this overall balance. Once again, very, very well balanced wine. You do get that beautiful, beautiful acidity that we would expect from a Caricante, but still, um, it's a complex wine. It's a wine that you really want to just sit with and kind of pick apart and see all the all of the little and, and very unique nuances that exist in it. We're gonna have to wrap this one up here, but again, guys, we're gonna be doing a specific focus on the wines from Etna and Les Sabie de Etna, de Etna. So you don't wanna miss that. I'm gonna move this one over to the side for a moment. All right, guys, it is time to move on to our second wine. And for that, we are going back out west to these beautiful hills outside of Trapani. This estate for this beautiful Nero Davola, which is a 2017, is Dagala Borromeo. I think I pronounced it right. Hopefully I did. Um, but again, what was the focus and what is the focus for this incredible estate? Well, here we're only 90 meters above sea level, so we're not that high. And again, we're talking about a, a sort of rolling hills, a plains area. Here, as in some of the, their other estates, understanding the soil came first and foremost. Understanding the amount of clay and what, what vines really and what indigenous autochthonous varieties would work well became the focus, which I think nowadays that kind of, that has to be your focus. Because if you're not looking to produce a wine that has a unique character, one that is given from the land, I think people are starting to understand that difference a little bit. Am I getting my identity from the producer or am I getting my identity from the land? Here, we expect nothing less than the land to give us everything that we need to produce an incredible wine. Nero Davola is a huge name in terms of Sicilian wines and wines also that generally come from the south of Italy. One would think that maybe even this grape didn't originate in Sicily. Well, again, the jury's still out. We're retracing our steps, we're retracing history, but there is a possibility that there is even a stronger connection with one of the original names of this wine. 
a name that is very close to the region of Calabria. But once again, when you break that word down, it seems to have an even closer tie with Sicily. So to say that this, that this grape has found itself a home would be an enormous understatement. So once again, we're gonna be jumping into this one with our good friend, the Coravin. Coravin sitting down is not something I would technically advise you to do. You kind of need a little bit of extra oomph to push it down. Uh, and always, if that is the case, maybe check out your needle and see if it's still sharp, how long you've used it, uh, if it's being consumed a little bit. It might be the right time to change that. Um, I think I've still got a little bit of wear and tear on mine left. Um, but it's always something to remember and check out. All right, so here once again at this estate, we're talking about really clay rich soils, but there still is a nice sandy element to them. Uh, that was basically, these are alluvial soils in a plains area kind of, so you have to think that water really brought these soils down and the, that, that's an important aspect to think about, especially when we talk about the drainage, how much water retention is there and also, the more clay there is, how that affects either the, the cooling of the soil or the heating up of the soil at certain times of the day. And that is definitely going to affect your maturation. Here, for me, Nero Davola is one of those grapes and uh, is one of those wines that really, really has always really connected me to the south of Italy. Uh, it's a wine that I always expect, expect to have a quite a strong character. Uh, and it's one of those, it's a wine wine, if you know what I mean. It's one of those that really is gonna give you all of those sensations that, that you would expect, both in terms of color, this rich, rich color. I know I didn't put too much in my glass, but uh, again, a beautiful uh, dark ruby. Um, and again, wow, just, I didn't even put the glass to my nose and these aromas are already coming out. And that once again is one of the characteristics of Nero Davola is a beautifully fragrant grape. Um, fragrant in terms of beautiful red fruits. Um, you get a touch of licorice in there as well. Um, so for this beautiful Nero Davola that is harvested in the middle of September, uh, it goes through six months in American oak barrel. Even there, that's a specific choice and a choice for a specific reason. Um, and unfortunately, I haven't had the time to talk and ask all of these questions, but I'm always interested in understanding what was the logic, what was the thought process, and especially, uh, I believe, what was the tasting like? What, what leads you to the decision to using uh, a specific type of wood? Like I said, six months in, in barrels and then six months in the bottle. Uh, this is a 2017. This is a really decisive nose. Um, everything comes at you in a very linear fashion and I really like that. It's, a, it's explosive, it's not explosive, it is impactful. But it's impactful, it's kind of just like a train going straight at you. Uh, once again, these beautiful dark fruits, a little bit of plum in there as well even get into a little bit of clove and just a very very inviting wine and a wine that I can understand again why in terms of international recognition why it's so important okay 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 I'm liking this I'm really really liking this wine um, tannins not so much not overly powerful there's nothing invasive about that there uh, again, really, really well-balanced wine, very harmonious. Nice medium persistency. This is not a super, super long wine, but it is very, very well, um, very well polished and it, it closes really nicely. Even that, it's quite decisive. The tannins, uh, there's a little bit of something there, but they're just silky, they're just enjoyable. Um, this wine, again, 
just so easy to enjoy, so easy to drink um, and taste. And also, this is, in my opinion, a very, very food-friendly wine, especially for um, cuisines that I think of in, in the US, um, whether it's you know grilling out, barbecuing, simple things where you just wanna, I say simple things, somewhere where you want just a, a great glass of wine to accompany and to accentuate what you are eating or what you are doing. Um, you know, I don't know what your personal taste is, but I could enjoy a glass by, of this by itself without any real issue. All right, guys, on to the last and final wine. This one right here is a part of their top wine line, which I'm very, very excited to try. This is coming all the way from 2014. This is a Pericone, uh, an ancient varietal that um, kind of had a rough go of it for a, a number of reasons. Um, but really, even thanks to Firiato and the work that they've done, uh, they've created their own clone. This is theirs. Nobody else is going to have the ver this version of a grape, which um, I think if you, I don't want to say if you know enough about wine, I don't mean it in a, in, a, in a negative way, but if you just think about that, nobody else has a grape, a specific grape clone that they do. Uh, that is pretty fantastic. And that shows their investment in the land and into the territory. Um, when I talk about it's kind of uh, not so illustrious past, there was a few reason, reasons for that. Um, and one of them was mainly tied to one of the greatest exports of the area, which was Marsala, Marsala Rubino specifically. This wine was used greatly over the years as a part of the overall recipe of Marsala. But with its decline, it declined as well. And this is just uh, one of the reasons. Part of the other reason has to do with Phylloxera, which is, again, this terrible disease that really ravaged uh, so many of the countrysides and winemaking territories, not only in Italy, but all over the world. Um, and this wine and its rebirth has isn't just like a isn't just like a passion project. It has a beautiful, beautiful. Uh, it, it's just a very unique grape. It's so beautifully uh, singular in what it offers and what it can give. If you've ever tasted Marsala and then you begin to think that the wine that was used to make Marsala and then was used in other grapes as kind of a cutting grape is now being vinified uh, in its in its own purity. 100% Pericone, you begin to understand and think about all of the beautiful and interesting notes that can come out of it as well. So let's dig in. All right, as we said before, thanks to Coravin, we're tasting all of these bottles with great ease, uh, even though you may have seen something in the stories that didn't look so easy, but hey, life happens. Uh, safety first though, guys, safety first. Um, this right here is a Pericone 2014. And again, this wine uh, is very, very much connected to the land that it comes from. So like we've said many times, that's really a part of what uh, Firiato's philosophy is. The wine or the grape and the land becoming almost eternally linked together. Uh, another aspect besides this wide range of kind of spice and fruit notes that Pericone is known for, it also can have a significant amount of tannins. Now, as we know, learning how to work with tannins and understanding them in the evolution and the maturation of the grape is something that takes great skill and know-how. So, Firiato, in my opinion, really kind of, I don't want to say gambled, I'm sure that they knew what they were doing when they did it, but they put these vines in a very, very unique place. So here goes John's attempt at pronouncing something correctly, Pianoro Cudia. Here, this desert-like atmosphere with extremely clay-rich soils. We're talking over 60%. Uh, instead of heroic viticulture, we're talking about heroic uh, agronomy because understanding how to, I don't wanna say make these grapes work, but seeing that small window, that small opening where they saw an opportunity of having a soil, a temperature, and, and really an overall microclimate that allowed for this, for this vine and these grapes to mature in a way that they were able to put out a, a really top-notch wine, uh, a fine wine at the highest level, 
and on top of that, make it to where people were able to discover Pericone for another time. Uh, it should also be noted that Pericone can go by, could go by, a different name, Pignatello. Uh, this is, again, it's, it's, it's not another grape, it's simply just another name for the same, for the same grape. Um, Again, we're talking about a very arid soil, extremely clay rich as we were talking about before. And this, I think, friends, is going to be something pretty unique. And once again, thanks to our friends at Italese for these incredible glasses. Now, I chose this glass right here really because um, I'm hoping that it really helps kind of unleash um, all of the aromas that could come from this wine. Um, so I really wanted to get all of the aromas out of this wine, so that's kind of why we chose one that's a little bit wider at the bottom. It tapers up a little bit, but all of this twirling is really going to set off some of these whoo, beautiful fragrances. First of all, this color, deep, deep, deep ruby, a little bit even purpley. Um, again, this is a wine's wine in my opinion. On the nose, wham, fruit, I'm talking uh, cherries, I'm talking prunes, um, dried prunes, dried fruit. Wow. This is, this is beautiful and, and there's a freshness to this wine as well which again is so in some sense count, counterintuitive uh, when you think about the territory that it comes from and how hot and how warm it can get. Uh, we are talking about a end of September, beginning of, of October harvest. So again, these grapes are going to go the distance in terms of maturation. All right, I'm pretty excited to taste. I'm not gonna hold back any longer. What I love so often in wines is, is finding a more kind of full-blown expression of what happened on the nose, um, on the palate. And that is very, very much the case here. Um, we're talking about these dark fruits. We're talking about kind of a, this uh, cherry that's kind of jammy. We're also getting into a little bit of licorice, uh, a little bit of clove. Wow. And again, beautiful acidity, extremely well-balanced wine, but these tannins are definitely present. Uh, I would love to see how this bottle ages over time and these, these fruits and these aromas just continue to evolve on themselves. Um, there's even something a little bit, there's a little bit of something that's a little bit that, a little bit in some way spicy, refreshing. There's a little bit of that black pepper, but then there's also that ginger. You know how ginger kind of wakes up your senses, it wakes up your palate? I feel like this wine does that as well. Um, absolutely beautiful. Again, overall complexity um, is just brilliant. You could sit here and pick, pick this wine to pieces in a very, very fun way and just enjoy its depth and its complexity. Here we're talking about French oak barrels, 10 to 12 months, and then six months in the bottle. Um, again, that's not too, too long in terms of spending time in wood with some of the other big reds that sometimes we talk about or we may hear about in Italy. Um, but that amount of time, in my opinion, is perfect. I don't find the wood to be intrusive at all, which is one of the things that I love. I think wood is a great, great tool and should definitely be used when it comes to winemaking. I mean, not that I'm someone who's, who's here to tell winemakers what they should be doing or not, um, but I'm not a lover of wood being intrusive. Um, I don't love overly vanilla wines and things of that nature. This one right here, understanding that this grape already has a lot of those unique spice notes um, inside of it already, that wood is really there to really kind of just mesh and soften those tannins and really bring the wine together and create a beautiful, beautiful balance. Guys. I'm gonna stop here because this is, like I said, the first of three different episodes. Uh, the next two are going to focus, uh, be a little bit more precise with their focus. Um, and one of them we will be talking about Etna. So for all you Etna lovers, we'll be spending some time getting to know the territory, the grapes, and the wines a little bit better. Uh, for now, I'm signing off, but know that I'm gonna continue tasting because there's a lot to unpack here. 
uh, in, in, a, in, a, in obviously the most beautiful way possible. So uh, thank you once again to Feriato. Thank you once again to all of you who hang out and watch. And uh, what can I say? Johnny Vino signing out. But until our next trip to Sicily, I'll see y'all soon.